Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. So kicking off with episode 9, um, I thought it'd be a good chance because of this being called episode 9, and obviously episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker was recently out. Uh, I'm not going to talk about The Rise of Skywalker, I'm still not going to say any spoilers for that, so don't worry about that. But what I thought would be good is as the first phase of the new canon is kind of ending, it, it's just good to kind of show where the canon started. Um, so essentially, as you guys know, anyone who's listening to you know Star Wars comics and canon, especially Episode Zero, I kind of explain everything. I try and give like an overview of a lot of the Star Wars content and things, and a lot of the ones I've done recently have been either one shots or mini series, which are quite easy to sort of speak about in fifteen twenty minutes, and I can do all the links to X Y Z and things, and it works quite well. Now, with this one, what I wanted to do is there's a main run of Star Wars comics that ran from January 2015 to November 2019. So it's almost spanning the time of Disney creating the new canon, which I believe was in late 2014. And then Episode 9 came out in December 2019. And obviously now we're in 2020, we're not going to get any more Star Wars films for a couple years, but we're going to get another series of The Mandalorian, hopefully the Kenobi series, potentially the Cassian Andor series, and potentially a sequel series to Star Wars Rebels. I know Star Wars Res Resistance exists, but it was made by some other people. I'm not going to get into the sort of details of that, but another series made by all the people who made Star Wars Rebels is due to come out soon as well. But basically at the moment, it's kind of quiet in the Star Wars canon, unless you're a reader, because in the comic world and in the book world, there's loads. So what I want to do is I'm going to keep it where each week is still going to be about different comics and things like that. But what I thought was this week, I'll start with the first canon Star Wars comics. So essentially, this e these ones, as I said, were released in early 2015, straight after Disney, basically his new canon. There was a couple of comics that had been released in the new canon to kind of kickstart it. Uh, the st main run of Star Wars comics, which ran 75 issues, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. That was one of the first ones. It was also the first run of the Darth Vader comics, which the third run is now currently just sort of starting up again. The Kanan comics they started as well Kanan is a character from Star Wars Rebels so yeah I'm going to do about that in a future episode and then also the Princess Leia comics as well uh, they all sort of started around the same time I'll be kind of dipping in and out of various comics over the coming weeks and things but each episode I try and keep it to sort of one comic or if it's a one shot I try and keep it to two comics but obviously I'm not going to sit here and talk about 75 issues of one comic run and that be one episode because even saying all the names of all the issues and stuff would take such a long amount of time. It's, it's just a waste. I don't want to rush it. I don't want to cram things in. So I just want to elaborate on this that I'm going to be speaking about the first story arc for the Star Wars comics. Now, there seem to be about 12 story arcs. And also they, the comics are released, obviously, bi-weekly sort of, or monthly. And then it does a continuous story. But after a certain amount of time, they normally release certain story arcs as one-offs. They call them volumes or annuals or even sometimes books it's a little bit confusing but essentially i am holding in my hands annual number one so this is issue number one of the main run of star wars comics up to issue number six and so it's the first story arc called skywalker strikes now i'll get into this in a second but i will say that next week it's going to be something different it's going to be i believe the han solo imperial cadet miniseries which talks about you know what happened with solo when he was in the imperial academy essentially what he talks about in solo a little bit and then after that i'll do some other ones and things but i will then return to do the next story arc for the main run of star wars comics in a month or so that sort of region i was thinking either on a monthly basis or maybe every five or six weeks or so i'll return to this now online it seems i think i've got them all anyway but it seems there's basically about 12 maybe 13 volumes for the main run of star wars comics so if i do one a month that is about a year and that will be pretty much all of the star wars main run of comics i will say running alongside these to make things a little bit more confusing as well for people in at some point coming forward i'll do this one-off episode about it but there's a thing called the screaming citadel that's what brings dr afra as a character 
into the main run of Star Wars comics. Dr. Aphra has her own set of series now, and she also appears in the first run of the Darth Vader comics. And also in the first run of Darth Vader comics, there is a special called Vader Down, and that is a crossover event between the Darth Vader comics and the Star Wars comics as well. So as you can see, with me only just talking about these things, as it's the main run of Star Wars comics, a lot of the things that happened at the same time there's a lot of crossovers. There's a lot of times where people are talking about events that have happened in other comics or that, as I say, characters appear that have appeared in other comics and things like that. Fortunately, in this issue, there's almost none of that. As I say, I do try and make sure that in these comic series and things that I show the appropriate links when new characters pop up I'll talk about them and that sort of thing which I will be doing but obviously where this is essentially the first new canon content really it's hard to show all the links because there really aren't that many so this is primarily going to be speaking about the narrative that is within this annual there's a couple of cool things in there like Boba Fett shows up and a few other things so it is a really good annual I do really recommend it um, but I will say I am going to be summarizing quite a lot of this obviously I can't just sit here and just read verbatim everything that happens in these comics and as I said there's not that many other links to other things so it is primarily just going to be speaking about the narrative which is set basically directly after A New Hope so that's generally what you guys can expect um, as I say if you like this one great probably next month or so there'll be the next one and it will keep going from there but I'm not going to just do the next 13 episodes of Star Wars comics and canon just about the main run of Star Wars comics frankly because I don't want to but also because it won't be that exciting for people who aren't as fussed on that because some people are going to be more interested in the Mace Windu mini series of comics or any of the other ones that have come out because there's so many comics now in the three eras of Star Wars being Age of Republic, Age of Rebellion and Age of Resistance obviously basically the prequel original and sequel trilogies and then also coming out in the next oh, i think it's around august time they're going to start the high republic comic series as well as the books that go along with that and the high republic is set 200 years before the phantom menace so there's going to be a lot of content so i'm going to try and keep short like try and keep up to date with certain things but with styles comics and canon i'm not going to be talking about the brand new comic that comes out and immediately jumping on that bandwagon that's not how i want to do this I want to do this as just, you know, introducing people to the canon steadily and slowly, letting them pick and choose whatever episodes they want. So with that in mind, let's get straight into it. Thank you for listening to all that preamble. Just want to make everything clear. So as I've said, this is book slash volume one. It's called Skywalker Strikes. The writer is Jason Aaron. The penciler is John Cassaday. And the colorist is Lauren Martin. Now, I will say for the main run of Star Wars comics, they do change the writer and colorist and things at points when it happens i'll let you guys know but for the first while it's those three issue number one was out on the 24th of january 2015 and issue number six was out june the 3rd 2015 and the skywalker strikes story arc as the six issues of the first run of Star Wars comics was released as the collection in october 6th 2015 so if you want to get your hands on the comics now i highly recommend against going and getting one issue at a time because it will take you forever and it'll cost a fair amount of money and most online comic book stores do have copies of these annuals as i said there's about 12 of them and they're anywhere between 8 and 15 pounds that's between like 10 and 20 dollars uh each so there's quite a lot if you buy them all at once but hopefully if you guys want to buy these and do it with me yay lots of fun there so as i said this is going to be me kind of trying to vaguely say some of the narratives and stuff so if you have read these comics and things and you feel like bits are missing that's going to be why as this is the main run of Star Wars comics, it has got Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Leia Organa, Chewbacca, R2-D2, and C-3PO in it, and obviously Darth Vader pops up. So let's get into the narrative. So the comic starts with basically a ship landing on a planet called Simon One. Uh, Han gets out and is greeted by some Imperials, and they basically say, you know, welcome, thank you for coming, let's get on with this. He's basically there because the Rebels intercepted an envoy filled with people who represent Jabba the Hutt. They were basically going to go and speak with the Empire to negotiate a deal. Now, basically what's happened is since the Death Star blew up, which from what I can tell is within maybe a couple days, couple weeks or so of this comic. So it, it's very, very soon after the Death Star blew up in A New Hope. And essentially the Empire is a bit scrambling a little bit because obviously they invested, you know, 20 odd years into this thing and it's just got blown up by, you know, a farm boy. 
And the Empire have used up a lot of resources in that. And that is said quite a lot in some of the other things. And in The Rise of Skywalker, once again, I'm not going to spoil it if anyone hasn't seen it. But in The Rise of Skywalker, one of the characters, I believe Pride, does mention something about the Death Star was basically a giant failure. Um, I think he actually mentioned that Starkiller Base was a giant failure as well. Um, so it's kind of like having one giant super weapon for many Imperials is not the way to go. Because if it gets destroyed, you've just, you know, all your eggs in one basket. So what the Empire are trying to do in these comic series is basically trying to get their resources back or not back but trying to build up the resources again because they spent so much time and money and effort into the Death Star and obviously all the ships that were within that and all that sort of other stuff as well as the personnel that were killed when the Death Star was blown up they're in a bit of panic essentially so they're going around the galaxy and they're trying to strike deals with crime syndicates and well, crime lords and people like that to try and get their resources up while they build up their th their essentially uh, stockpile while they're still fighting the rebellion so that's basically what the reason for this uh, meeting is and obviously as i say the rebels intercepted one of jabba's envoys and they basically took the ship i presume and then pretended to be it and went along with it so Han speaks with the Imperials, Leia and Luke are in disguise, sort of right near them, Chewie is up somewhere high up, he's got like a scope, he can see what's going on, he's kind of a, being a sniper in some sense, and C-3PO has been left with the Millennium Falcon that's been parked in some sort of junk heap, trying to hide it and things, and that's basically where it goes. They get let into the Imperial factory, that's the, these negotiators, and the Empire basically says very firmly, you'll get what you're given, there's no negotiating here, we will tell you what you get, you will accept it, you will leave, nothing else. And essentially, while they're walking to the, the right place, Han then basically says, go on R2, and then R2 sprays some sort of fluid on the floor, he gets his taser thing out, shoots the fluid, and it electrocutes all these stormtroopers. After all the stormtroopers are knocked out or dead or whatever, um, all the, only, the only person that's left is the overseer, who basically let them all in and stuff, and he's like saying, your rebels are doomed, you know, I'm never going to help you, blah blah blah, and then obviously they raise a gun to him and he immediately tells them exactly where to go. They punch him, knock him out, and then go trying to find what they're trying to do. Now, I can't remember exactly where in the comic it specifically states it, so I'll just say here, because you know, there's not really any spoilers in air quotes, because I'm telling you the whole plot, is that they're there to blow up this weapons factory. Now, it's called Weapons Factory Alpha, and it's known as the largest, or at least one of the largest, weapons manufacturers for the Empire. So obviously, while the Empire is struggling with after the Death Star get blown up and stuff, they're relying quite heavily on a lot of these factories to keep production going, so they've got enough stuff to keep going and things. So they get in there, they basically rig the system to blow, they want the whole thing to go into meltdown, essentially the reactor, and while they're doing that, Luke kind of wanders off, he goes down some stairs, and he finds this cage full of slaves. Now, all of the slaves are aliens. Now, when I say aliens, I mean not human, because a lot of people don't know this, but the Empire is actually very for lack of a better word, racist. I, I, I don't know the exact terminology within Star Wars, but they're very prejudiced against anyone that isn't human. Sidious slash Palpatine, he was very much against anyone who isn't human. So obviously there's a very much a fascist sort of Hitler-y undertone there, which obviously Star Wars does do a lot of parallels to real life history and stuff. But they often use slaves. That's why the Wookiees are actually famously slaved during the time of the Empire, obviously during the Clone Wars and Prior to that, they were all free on Kashyyyk and stuff. The Empire enslaved relatively all of them. And in this factory, Lucas found, yeah, a cage full of... There's some Mon Calamari in there, which is the species of Akbar, which I spoke about in the episode before last, I think. There's some Bith in there. Bith are the species that you may remember in the Mos Eisley Cantina in A New Hope. The ones playing the instruments, the, you know, the cantina music. Da, 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 da. The, that species of the people, the species of aliens that are playing those instruments in there are called Bith. Um, there's also there's some Ithorians in there, there's Twi'lex, um, I believe there's Zabrak and Togruta, um, which is a Sokotano species as well as Shark T, so quite a few humanoids in there. Luke basically tries to let them out, this slaver guy comes up to him with a whip and says no, Luke basically with his lightsaber manages to cut his hand off, breaks the lock and says come on slaves you're free. What's quite cool here as well is when the slaver came up to Luke initially, he did try and do a Jedi mind trick on him, and it failed. And it was just quite humorous that he was like, you will let these slaves go. And he's like, what are you on about? And he's like, ah, it was worth a try. You know, that it's just quite fun where in the films you see Luke jumping between the films, New Hope, Empire, and Return of the Jedi. Luke changes quite a lot his strength in the Force. Obviously, in the first film, he has little to none. In Empire, it starts off with him basically being on half, and then he uses the Force to force pull the lightsaber and cut off the arm of the Wampa, which is the Yeti big thing. 
And obviously in Return of the Jedi, he uses Force Choke on a Gamorrean guard. Uh, he, try, he uses mind tricks on Jabba's sort of, sort of right-hand man called Bib Fortuna. He's the one who's got like a tentacle-y thing going around him and stuff. You'd recognize him when you see him. So obviously seeing the films, Luke seems to make leaps and bounds in the Force. But obviously between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, it is around three years. And then between Empire and Return of the Jedi, it's around six months to a year. So these comics are very good at bridging the gap between A New Hope and Empire, and just a little reference too, I've mentioned this is the first run of mainline Star Wars comics, that's because this actually, as I said earlier in this, this has already ended, and the new run of Star Wars comics is actually set between The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. So when they've both finished, both mainline Star Wars comics will run between the original trilogy films, filling the gaps to the brim essentially of content of what happened in those times. Throughout this comic as well, there's a lot of times where Han and Leia are by themselves. They often sort of flirt with each other, but not in the, the overt, obvious flirting, but, you know, they kind of bicker and stuff, like an air quotes, like an old married couple, that sort of thing. And you can kind of see the spark between them where Leia's starting to realise that Han isn't as bad as she thinks he is, and Han's starting to realise that Leia isn't as stuck up as he thinks she is. And you can kind of see that going, which is quite nice, but I'm not going to go through all the dialogue of every time they interact, because it's quite a lot. Luke returns to Han and Leia, um, they're basically saying, cool, we'll leave now, and then Chewie says, oh, the negotiator is here, turns out it's Vader, um, so obviously that causes a lot of issues, so then Han says, right, do not shoot him, don't at any point shoot him, we'll just have to leave, if you shoot him, it's going to set the alarms, Leia says, no, look, you need to shoot him, if we can kill him, this may change everything, you need to get rid of Vader, so Chewie shoots Vader, Obviously, he doesn't kill Vader. Vader just deflects the blaster bolt. But Chewie shoots quite a few of them. And so Vader deflects one of them and then lifts up two stormtroopers and holds them in the way as a sort of meat shield, which I found to be really, uh, I say really cool. Obviously, it's quite grim in real life, but Vader is obviously such a badass and he will survive by any means necessary. Just literally lifting it with the force, two stormtroopers in the way to block gunfire. That's just pure Vader and I loved it. So that happens, he sees the Chewie was the one doing it, and Chewie's on this, it's some sort of high up building, it's like a little sniper tower stand thing, uh, it's just made of like metal girders and that sort of stuff, it's not very sturdy. Vader sees what Chewie's doing and basically brings the whole thing that he's on down. So after they shoot Vader, the alarms go off, because Vader's like, look, Rebels clearly attacking, let's get st stuff sorted. The alarms go off, and then they go to see 3 po okay, you're in the ship, you've got the Millennium Falcon, Chuck on autopilot, come pick us up, we'll get out of here. And C-3PO says there's a problem because the scavengers on the planet have already started stripping the Falcon. And obviously C-3PO is not one to really confront people, even though Han Solo says grab my blaster, go out and sort them out. You can probably tell that C-3PO doesn't do that. And one of the things I love about this comic series is actually that it shows that when Vader and Luke fought in Empire Strikes Back, that is not the first time they actually confronted each other. Um, obviously, in A New Hope, they have that vague interaction where Vader's TIE fighter is behind Luke's X-Wing in the Death Star Trench. But what you're alluded to is that when they see each other on Empire, that's the first time they've actually seen each other since A New Hope. Well, that's not the case. Essentially, this whole comic arc is all about Vader trying to find out the name of the pilot who blew up the Death Star. That's basically what Vader's task is at the moment. He's trying to track him down. So, But Luke squares up to Vader while in this base, while everything's going mental, essentially. He squares up to Vader. Now, Vader's one of the most notorious and one of the most powerful Jedi killers that's ever existed. L Luke, after A New Hope, is quite weak. A little bit of a bitch, let's be honest. With, <laughs> let's be honest. And... He, he's just weak, he's not trained in the Force and all that sort of stuff, and he's always calling out for Ben, you know, not really trying to fend for himself as much. So he decides he wants to square up against Vader and avenge his father and avenge Ben Kenobi and things like that. And that's how all the first issue ends. So the most of the second issue, or at least the first half of it, is them fighting. And it's actually a really cool fight because Vader's basically just toying with him. He says at one point, this is most pathetic. You're not worth the seconds it would take to finish you. Who sent you here to die like this? And then Luke basically says, you know, I was on the Death Star, I saw what you did to Master Kenobi. He swings his lightsaber at Vader and things. Vader just force pulls the lightsaber clean out of Luke's hand and basically holds them almost in a cross about to cut Luke's head off. He then momentarily stops and looks at the saber and goes, wait a minute, this lightsaber is owned by. And then an AT-80 leg crushes in through the ceiling of the place which is driven by Han Solo and Leia who hijacked an AT-80. Now just for clarity AT-80 it's the big 
walker things that are in empire strikes back they're the really huge ones that they need to use the snow speeders to wrap the ropes around their legs to make them fall over they're very very strong and they're very hard to destroy if you don't have ion blasters which is a special type of blaster that pierces metal and is specific for like mechanical things and ships if you don't have one of them you're pretty screwed and for clarity an AT-AT stands for all terrain armored transport they are also shown in the Battle of Scarif in Rogue One as well. They're in other Star Wars things too. But yeah, they're pretty hard to destroy. And for clarity, obviously, just to make sure you guys are aware, when Vader's holding the lightsaber, he says, wait a minute, this lightsaber belongs to... That was Anakin's lightsaber that Obi-Wan took from Anakin after severing three of his limbs on Mustafar in Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Obviously, he takes that and that's the lightsaber he gives to Luke. So Vader recognizes it's Anakin's for a moment just before the AT, AT leg comes in and distracts them. That happens and all hell breaks loose even more. Some of the slaves that were rescued earlier start trying to fight the Imperials. The at is like breaking through that Han and Leia are piloting. It's like breaking through the factory, destroying a lot of things. Luke's basically trying to escape and he's like trying to rally some of the slaves. Vader's just slaughtering people left, right and centre. Leia and Han are then squabbling, basically, you know, saying, why do you choose the only at at that weapons aren't sorted out yet? If we had blasters, we could shoot them and things rather than just trying to step on people. Han basically says to R2-D2 and a little Jawa that's in the little controls and some wiring saying, you guys need to hurry up, blah, 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 that sort of thing. I only brought that up because I thought it was quite cute watching seeing a Jawa and an R2, R2-D2 R2 in the in an at trying to repair the weapons. It just kind of made me giggle a little bit. It flashes back for a moment to the Millennium Falcon when C-3PO goes out and tries to you know shoot the people who have been stripping the vehicle, stripping the Millennium Falcon. He gets shot basically immediately um, because C-3PO is useless relatively and it cuts back to this sort of battle at hand. Luke is trying to escape, running away basically from Vader essentially and those Imperial forces. He's basically muttering to himself, you know, what am I going to do? This is all my fault. I'm just some stupid farm boy from Tatooine. I don't belong here. And then he sees speeder bikes, which are seen in Return of the Jedi, that Luke and Leia fly on the Forest Moon of Endor. That's what they kind of look like. like motorbikes that wheels and really long bits out the front. He jumps on one of them, flies it straight into at Vader and Stormtroopers, tries to shoot them. Obviously, Vader moves and he kills a lot of the Stormtroopers. And then the at is coming up behind Vader after Luke basically distracted it uh, so, to some degree. And then this at leg comes down to crush Vader and Han and Leia are like, yes, we're about to crush Vader. And then they're like, wait a minute, the leg's stuck, what's going on? And Vader is stood underneath this at leg, just holding it up with the Force. And Han's like, you got to be kidding me. And it's just like, obviously Han is so sceptical about the Force. And throughout this comic, quite frequently, he says, look, I don't believe in the Force, all this sort of stuff. And then by the time you get to Empire, maybe Return of the Jedi, he starts to kind of be a bit more like, okay, I've seen a lot of stuff, it's probably real, so <laughs> let's go with that. But at this time, he's still denying it quite a lot. Vader starts to basically crush the at at He's holding his hand up and it's sort of making all these sparks fly out and things are breaking and stuff. And Han's basically saying, has R2 and the Jawa sorted out the guns? We really need it right now. We're about to be crushed. And then they manage to fire on Vader. They think they've killed Vader. Obviously, I'm not going to keep saying they haven't killed Vader because everyone knows that Vader dies in Return of the Jedi. But they, they think they've killed Vader. And... They kind of cheer a little bit, essentially. They think they've sorted it. They leave. Luke is like, no, I don't think you have destroyed it. You don't understand the power of the Force. And then, like, Vader comes out of all the wreckage. Now, one part here I really like is when Vader comes out of the wreckage, one of the stormtroopers find him. And I'm just going to read what he says. He says, oh, Lord Vader, we have... And then you see Vader kind of rise up without his helmet on. So you can see the back of his sort of burnt head. And he's wheezing. And the stormtrooper says, Mother of Moons, I'm... I'm sorry, my lord. I didn't realise. And before he can finish his statement, Darth Vader basically twists his entire neck around with the Force, like snapping his neck. And so obviously, not sure if people are aware of this, but Vader, if anyone saw Vader without his mask on, unless it was Palpatine, he would basically kill them. So it's very much, obviously, it showed weakness and things, and that was not what Vader was about. So if any Stormtroopers ever seen without his helmet on, he will just kill them straight up. And then it shows among all this craziness, Luke managed to get his lightsaber back. So now he's flying, or he's driving around with the speeder bike with the lightsaber out, just like swiping stormtroopers here and there. Vader's obviously okay and starts to go towards the at, -AT. He starts hacking at the at ats legs, trying to sever them and things like that. While in the meantime, Chewie has managed to, obviously Chewie's fine. Chewie gets to the Millennium Falcon. He rescues 3PO from these things, these scavengers that have shot him. And then Vader severs basically the last leg of the at, -AT and it falls. 
as the ATAT falls, Vader says, look, everyone going for the kill. While this happens, Luke zooms past all of them, goes back to the reactor and says, no, look, we couldn't have come here for no reason. I need to blow up this reactor. We need to have caused something rather than just letting so many people die and so much a waste of time, blah, blah, blah. So Vader says, look, I'm going to go sort out this farm boy. I'm going to go sort out this guy on the speeder bike who's gone back into the reactor. You guys stay out here, fight. As Luke zooms in, Vader's hot on his tail in a ship, basically shooting at him and stuff. And as this happens, you've got um, the overseer of the of the facility saying, oh, the catastrophe has finally been averted. Thank the stars, that was a close one. And then Luke immediately zooms past them, shoots one of the cores behind, and then it says, warning, the power core is destabilized. It's basically going to overload and things. And then the overseer says, no, this can't happen. Lord Vader will have my... And then before he finishes his sentence, Vader's sort of ship zooms past and decapitates him so i thought that was just quite a funny thing as well as luke's getting out his bike gets hit by a shot from vader he does manage to get out in a nick of time he manages to get to the millennium falcon and vader's basically just left with this factory crumbling around him now that sounds like it would be the end it's actually not there's still another three issues it's only halfway through but these last issues they're not as dense narratively so i'm gonna once again kind of try and bullet point these a little bit more so issue four starts with vader goes and speaks with jabba the hut because as i said at the start empire has lost a lot of resources needs to try and basically build them up again and they basically go around threaten the crime lords and say look we'll come in here and just end your entire operation and things or you can give us what we want we'll turn a blind eye that's basically what vader and jabba discuss Jabba also mentions that Vader has asked for bounty hunters to get hired to find this farm boy and things, which Palpatine doesn't seem to know about at this time. And they have some sort of conversation about that. And then Jabba says, okay, cool. Well, we've got a deal between the Empire and myself. We'll do what you want us, blah, blah, blah. But before you leave, I like to you know shake hands on the deal, essentially, by watching something die. While they're having their conversation and things, it flashes to Luke, who's doing his training, and he's fighting those little orb things that are the training droids that shoot little stunny bolts out that were in uh, a new hope that you saw they're in i think the prequels as well a little bit luke tries to do that he basically fails miserably and then he says to leia and stuff he's like Look, i can't be in the rebellion anymore i need to go out i need to be a better jedi i need to learn some of the things so he goes off and says first place to look it's going to be tatooine so he heads back to old ben's place of living while this is happening as well sorry if this starts getting a little bit confusing there's a hooded figure who goes to this cantina and is confronted by a couple of Rodians. Rodian is a species that Greedo was. They're basically green aliens, which are humanoid. Uh, they've got little antennas and things. It's Greedo. You should know who he is. <laughs> and essentially, they confront this woman because she says, like, I need to find out what's happened. There's someone who's been here recently. I need to find out who it is. You know, I've put out a big amount of money to try and get this person. They were like, yep, give us all the money, hand it over. The person's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And then says the word knees and then it turns out that they have a voice activated sentry gun under the table and it shoots all their knees out which is pretty intense and then she's like right now you can help me where i'm looking for solo and they're like no nope, we're not going to help you and they pull out a blast one of them pulls out a blaster and then she just goes hands and then you hear screaming and then when it cuts back to them a little bit after you see they haven't got any basically a stump and they say they're still not going to talk so she says okay lips and they go wait 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 and then, obviously, insinuating lips is gonna they're going to be shot with this sentry thing. And then they basically give her a bit of information. And the information is basically just, he killed our brother Greedo. We're looking for him. We think he'd probably already be dead. And then this figure basically says, Han Solo belongs to me. I'm going to go get him. Cuts back to Vader and Jabba, who are watching some Banthas being killed. Banthas are just these really big kind of hairy cow beings that are in uh, Tatooine you would see them in the prequels kind of the, in the background and things like that and you're watching just this sail barge that Jabba has basically loads of people shooting these things um, and then Salicious Crumb which is the weird little rat thing that is in Return of the Jedi that has that horrible cackling <laughs> sort of laugh that hangs around with Jabba you see a bit where Salicious Crumb says that <laughs> and then Vader says if you value that creature's life you should tell it to never do it again in my my presence which i just thought vader hearing salicious crumb probably felt how we all felt about it which is i hate it please <laughs> please kill it so i thought that was a little fun thing to add in there too and then jabba basically says something to vader about kenobi and says who knew you know this farm boy from tatooine who knew so much so much power could come from tatooine essentially and vader looks off into the distance obviously because anakin was from tatooine 
The four Rodians I mentioned earlier that were approached by that hooded figure and things, they're approached by someone again. This someone is basically saying, we need to find out where, I need to find out where Kenobi is, let me know. And they're like, uh, why? And then the person pulls out a gun and they go, um, okay, fine, we'll tell you. And then it shows to be Boba Fett who's looking for Kenobi. Obviously showing that Vader hired Boba to basically try and track down Luke Skywalker to find out his name and more information about him and try and basically get the rebel who blew up the Death Star. Boba continues to search around trying to find out if anyone knows anything about Kenobi and then tries to find out about Skywalker. Obviously he doesn't know who Skywalker is at that point so he's just trying to find out who this person is and he finds this seemingly younger sort of person who knew him and he says his name is Luke Skywalker because he used to kind of be friends with him and him and Biggs which is uh, one of the guys who's in A New Hope who's one of the friends of Luke's he basically says that we used to call Luke Wormy which is interesting I'm not sure where that came from but there you go so it's just a little nickname from that Boba gets the name and then kills the person who told him in the meantime, Han and Leia basically go off. They're going to try and find some other rebel base because one of the main issues of the Rebellion at the moment is that their main base on Yavin 4 got discovered by the Empire in A New Hope. And although it didn't get destroyed by the Death Star, the Empire still know where they are. So they need to flee and trying to find a new base of operations, which is basically the number one priority of the Rebellion. Leia says she can help with that. She'll get Han, Chewie, hoping for Luke as well to basically go off and find this other base. Obviously, Luke bails and says he's going to go become a Jedi. So Leia says she has to deal with basically having Han. They go off and then some TIE fighters approach them. They basically lose the TIE fighters, get onto this planet, which is uh, part of the Monsua Nebula. And this hooded figure basically is tracking them and says, Monsua Nebula, I knew it. A dog always returns to its favourite den. Meanwhile, Luke's at Ben Kenobi's hut, trying to search for some stuff, and then Boba Fett appears. Him and Boba Fett fight for quite a while. It's a pretty cool fight, actually. It's quite interesting to see sort of Luke. He first gets blinded by like a flashbang sort of thing, so he has to try and use the force to deflect blaster bolts and to kind of fight Boba Fett. He says his armor's quite loud and stuff, so that helps him in things. And how the fight relatively sort of ends is that they're tussling and things like that, and then Luke uses the force and pulls this metal box that smashes Boba in the head seemingly knocking him out so he can escape it then turned out that box was from Ben to Luke and within it contained the journals of Ben Kenobi when Luke actually used the force and pulled this it was a metal box that contains the book within it when this metal box hit Boba he actually straight afterwards was like I don't even know what happened there I don't know how I did that so that's seemingly the first time in canon that Luke ever used a force pull ability and it was against Boba Fett in Ben Kenobi's hut well, on Tatooine so who'd have known that back to Leia and Han they're basically flirting a bit in this place Han has found this little in clove that he says look no one will find us here no one knows about this blah 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 as soon as he finishes saying that this hooded figure in the ship immediately appears starts kind of firing at them and then lands near them and as it lands leia says to han who enough is this person and this person she is a woman called sana solo and she says that she is han solo's wife and that kind of ends their little part there and then the last part of the four comics is essentially boba goes back to vader says that he lost him Vader says that's disappointing. And he says, did you bring me anything of value? Yeah, we've, I've got his name. So Vader's like, well, tell me. Boba says, Skywalker. Vader says nothing and isn't looking at him. Boba says, we're done here then, and leaves. And Vader, while on this Star Destroyer, looking at this giant window, looking through space, clenches his fist, and then all of the window around him cracks. So he actually found out that seemingly likely his child actually survived that it's actually the person who blew up the death star is his own son and he found this out from boba fett who he hired to get this sort of information or to find the person who was the rebel pilot so palpatine didn't tell him he found out from boba fett which is a quite a cool little connection in the lore so that's basically where the narrative ends. So in this book, it basically finishes with a woman who it claims to be Han Solo's wife appears. Luke's got the journals of Ben Kenobi and Vader has just found out that the person who blew up the Death Star, their surname is Skywalker. So that's basically where this ends. As I said in the coming weeks, I think next week I'm going to do the Han Solo Imperial Cadet comic, but in a month or so I will then do part two of this one. I'll try and do more connections and things. I don't usually like just sat here and reading the entire narrative to people, but obviously for people to understand it, I have to tell some of the narrative. And for a comic that's now been out for over five years, I don't really worry about spoilers too much. So that's more or less where I'm going to end it, guys. Um, I will also say there is a individual comic out called The Journals of Ben Kenobi. That's going to be 
I think that's getting released in July, but it seems to be just loads of snippets from the various Star Wars comics and things. So the annual number two has the Journals of Obi-Wan Kenobi standalone comic in it. It's number seven. So issues one to six is the Skywalker Strikes arc. Issue number seven is just a one-off Journals of the old Ben Kenobi. And then issue number eight continues with the next story arc for the, you know, Han, Leia and Chewie and Luke. So that that's generally where we are. With that journals one i think i'm going to at some point in the coming months i'll probably just do a standalone episode just about the journals of ben kenobi i'll look through all the star wars comics that has it and i'll basically piece those together that's about it for me guys then i'm gonna stop pretty sharpish because i don't want to be rambling on for too much longer thank you so much for listening i really appreciate it be sure to check out my show genuine chit chat found in the same place that you'll find this show and check out all the other wonderful shows on the comics in motion feed really appreciate you guys listening give me any feedback you can all my contact details will be in the information you know or you can find me on social media at genuine chit chat thanks so much guys and may the force be with you